I usually do, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, let's see. Slides. Um, I think uh, Ethan or Nikhil can share I'm them. I'm putting then... them up right now. Yeah. Okay. Great. And then, uh, and then, code-wise, um, I think you can just open a blank, uh, a blank QT creator um, project. Um, I, I'm, I was a little hesitant to share something because we'll be using some fairly new stuff today from C plus plus seventeen. Uh, so, and then I'm, I'm not super sure if your compilers will support that. Maybe, maybe not. But, um, but if not, then uh, then I will. Uh, I'll actually be demonstrating a lot of the code using uh, using this 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 website over here. Uh, if you've taken CS one hundred seven, uh, you might have used this website before. It's um, it when you type code out here, it will actually generate assembly code that you can actually see. You don't have to understand assembly code today, although uh, although I, I will highlight some really interesting things about the assembly code that we will do today uh, at the end. Okay, so yeah, the uh, the the URL for this is is over here. Uh, this link sh should give you this, this access to the um, to the compiler. Yeah, in fact, uh, it allows C plus plus seventeen, also the C plus plus twenty um, compilers as well. All right, then let's get started. All right, so um, yeah, my, my name is Avery. Uh, I was the I was one of the one hundred six L lecturers uh, last year, and and I am super excited to talk to you about template metaprogramming today. So uh, as the overall agenda, what we'll start with, we'll talk about some motivating examples, uh, which will introduce the concept of that we're, how we're gonna compute, do computations on types. Normal programs that you've written, um, you, the, the general concept of a program is that you are gonna be processing data, you're gonna do some computations with data, and then you, you, um, you return some, some process version of the data. But instead, we're gonna kind of change our model of computation and we're gonna start thinking about computations on types. Instead of values, like, in, uh, like, the, um, like a three of variables themselves, we're actually trying to, gonna do computations on these types, ints, doubles, references, consts, and so on. Then we'll talk about meta functions, which are which are which act like functions, but they're not really functions. And then we're, we're going to implement two uh, meta functions together. One is called identity, um, just to get you all prepared with what a meta function is. And then we're actually going to learn uh, learn a few more complicated template rules, which will help us implement another uh, meta function called is same. And then finally, we're going to wrap everything up with uh, with const expr, which is a really new uh, development in C++. All right. Then without further ado, let's get started. So uh, just uh, as an overall disclaimer, the goal for today is to try to introduce some more advanced template concepts. Uh, we'll introduce at least two or three. And then uh, th we'll also see how these template concepts are actually useful. Um, without a doubt today, a lot of the code will feel very unnatural. And you'll likely get the overwhelming feeling that, that the code that we're writing, whoever designed C++ did not intend for you to use, use C++ in this way. Okay, it will feel very hacky. And that is actually um, that is actually pretty on point because this part of C++ was unintentional. It was literally discovered by accident. Uh, in 2003, I think, um, some C++ programmer presented at, at the C++ conference, and then they showed this this weird program, which uh, which was completely not not how it was supposed to be used, but it did something interesting. Okay, and this has led to right now where now it's become very useful, and you'll see it everywhere in the STL. Okay, now uh, TMP, so template metaprogramming, you might be asking, this code looks weird, will I ever write TMP code? Answer is maybe. If you're implementing libraries, then you definitely will see TMP code. Okay, so I'll show you some examples from PyTorch, I'll show you some examples from the STL, which use TMP code extensively. However, no matter what, uh, what you end up doing with C++, you will likely see some TMP code when you're trying to debug template error messages. So it's very useful to understand what these error messages are saying. Um, uh, I'm sure Ethan and Nikhil have shown you examples where, uh, where you, you've tried compiling a program, it generates a, a, a ton of error messages. And, uh, and today we'll actually see what some of those error messages mean. Uh, because of this, because some of you, um, like t writing TMP code is not necessarily what, what everyone will be doing. I want you to focus on the high level intuitions of what is TMP, why do we need TMP rather than like the exact syntactical details? Okay, all right. Now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about a motivating example. So let, uh, I'm actually going to start uh, trying to implement. Uh, let's let's pull up the, the compiler. Okay, so here's the idea. 
the motivating example is we want to implement a function that kind of works like this. So let's uh, let's include vector. Uh, let's include deck. Let's include set. Okay, uh, just to make our lives easier, let's use using namespace std. And what, what I'm going to do is I'm first going to create a vector of names. Okay, so I'm going to create a vector of names. Let's say uh, the names are Avery. Uh, uh, let's, you'll see why this is important later. Let's do Ethan, Nikhil, and Anna. Okay, so we have a, a vector of names. And what I want to do is I want to implement this function. So uh, this function called distance, which essentially takes in two iterators. So let's say, um, but we can actually get two iterators from this um, from this vector. Let's say uh, we have an Anna iterator, which points to Anna. We can do as, uh, find uh, names.begin and, and then Anna. So, so what this does is it, it finds the element uh, Anna and it returns an iterator to Anna. We can also do return an iterator to me, names.find, names.end, and, and a. Okay, so does this um, does this example right now make sense? So what we're basically doing is we're, we're creating a vector. We're, we're getting some iterators uh, from that vector, which point to Anna and Avery. Oops, this should be Avery. All right, and then what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to write a function called distance, which takes in two iterators, and it basically returns what the distance between these two iterators is. Okay, so in this example. Uh, also, this color isn't really annoying right now. The color will be useful later, but it's not use important yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to dark mode so you don't see the color. There we go. All right. Uh, yeah. So, so what would this distance function return? Well, this distance function would return four because and this first iterator is pointing to uh, this first element. Uh, this Avery is pointing to this last element. And then the distance between them would be one, two, three. So you'd increment the first iterator three times to get the last iterator. Okay, so, so this is the function that we're going to implement. Um, the STD, um, the, the standard library already has a distance function. And, uh, and you can actually see, uh, if you run the program right now, it returns three. Okay. All right, so, so th this is basically the, the, the overarching example we're going to use today. Okay, let's just quickly implement uh, an example of, of distance. Uh, let's call it my distance so there's no conflict. And while I'm typing this out, think about how would you implement distance? Distance here, we want it to be as generic as possible so that even if we change vector to like deck or if we change deck to set, we can use this distance function by passing in just arbitrary iterators, kind of like the STL algorithms themselves. So let's, uh, let's write it as a template where we're going to pass in an arbitrary uh, iterator type. And then distance to return a size t of which takes in two parameters, distance, uh, an iterator to the first and iterator to the last. All right, now let's think about how would we implement this. Uh, let's see, size two, yeah. All right, so let's think about how we would implement this. So one way to implement this, and uh, and the, the, uh, I, I might go into a bit of, of review of iterators, but one way to implement this is to do something like last minus first. Okay, so if this were, um, let's see, if this was a vector, recall that um, that that vectors, th there are different categories of iterators from most powerful to least powerful. The most powerful iterator is the random access iterator. Uh, I actually have a slide on that, I think. Yeah, okay. So I actually have a slide on this where, um, where we call that there are different categories of iterators. Uh, the most powerful iterator is the random access iterator, which allows you to move uh, arbitrary iterators by an arbitrary amount forwards and backwards. So you can do plus equals three, then the iterator jumps forward by three steps. Okay, that's as opposed to other kinds of iterators where uh, they don't allow random access. You can you have to increment these iterators one by one by one. So the random access iterator, uh, vector, what collections have random access iterators? Vectors, decks, arrays, while uh, the other collections that you know, map, set, list, they don't have random access iterators. They, they, they have forward iterators or other less powerful iterators. So okay. um, just a question from the um, Stiopa uh -huh. who asks, how, if we're building this template function, right? How can we make mm -hmm. sure it is actually a temp iterator type and not like int or string? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good, good question. So, uh, so let's see. 
there are two parts to this question. The first is how do we insert an iterator type? Uh, previously, what uh, what when you've written uh, these 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 functions, these template functions, you would be the there is sort of this. I, I think that the term that was used was implicit interface, where uh, where if the where if when you are the, the code inside the, the the template function, if it doesn't work for a for a template type, but for for example, if instead of passing in the iterator, we pass in like a, like the, the vector, then what will happen is that as the, the as the compiler tries to figure out what your type iterator is. So right now, if it determines that it, the it type is actually a vector. And then what happens here is that we should get a compiler error. Well, we should get a compiler error. OK, that was not a very useful compiler error. Well, we error. can see it under the minus if you go up to the minus function. Uh, return from last minus first, right? Or... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there, there we go. There we yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so here you can see that, um, that the implicit interface that the type has to satisfy, it must have a minus function. Whatever type it is must have a minus function. Uh, because the vector does not have a minus function, it fails this, um, this implicit interface. OK. But another uh, question that you should ask here is, this only works if iterator is a random access iterator. OK, so let's actually go just go back to this. OK, so Anna iterator and a reiterator. This my distance function only works if it is a random access iterator. Okay, because recall that only random access iterators have have that minus sign. So, what? Why would that be an issue? Well, if we change this to a deck, should still be fine. Still be fine because decks have random access iterators. So when it calls my distance, it's able to do this minus sign. But let's say we change this to a set. Then we get a compiler error because set iterators they don't have that minus sign. Okay, so because of that. This uh, function, it works for random access iterators, but it doesn't work for all uh, other kinds of iterators. So one way to fix that is, OK, well, this doesn't work. But instead, you could, uh, you could do the, the brute force way of trying to find distance, right? Uh, create a result, and then keep incrementing first. So while first is not equal to last, keep incrementing it. And then count how many times you have to increment, and then return the result. So for example, uh, if this was a vector, then we would be taking first, so the, the iterator to Anna, and incrementing it three times, so three. If this was a set, if it's a set, it's a little different because the set is sorted. So Anna and Avery should actually be adjacent, which is why when you run this code, it returns one. We call that sets are sorted. Okay, And now, because we've implemented this as this, um, this code does not assume that the iterator type is a random access iterator, right? Right now, we're, all we're doing is doing the plus plus on these uh, iterators. All iterators mm -hmm. allow you to, to increment them. So this code works for all types. Um, yeah. So if we left the function like this in the uh, in in our code, uh, this would work for any type. Uh, what would a drawback of this piece of code of this function be? Anyone have, have any thoughts? Why might this piece of code be not ideal? And think about efficiency, right? The first one we tried was super efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's the problem with always assuming that we're going to do this loop? Right. So so um, before, when we wrote the uh, last minus first, this is super efficient. If iterator was a random access iterator, this calculates the distance in O of one time. Right. You can just imagine you have two iterators. You're just calculating the distance between them. Uh, so this is very, very fast. Okay. If if it is a random access iterator. If it's not a random access iterator, then you must do this. The code right now will always run this slow version, even if it is a random access iterator. Okay. Right now, this code, for any kind of iterators, it will do this O of n, um, where, where n is the distance. It will always run this O of n code. Okay, which um, which which seems like um, seems like a shame, right? Because if it is a random access iterator, you could have implemented this function way faster. Okay, now if you if you actually look at the implementation of uh, of of uh, the distance function in the STL, you'll actually see that if you look at the complexity here, it will say 
it will say that the distance function uh, is linear time, O of n. But if the input iterator is of type uh, random access iterator, then the complexity is constant. So somehow the STL implementation achieved the best of both worlds, right? It, what it does is if uh, in general, it will run this O of n version, which works in general. But if iterator is specifically a random access iterator, then it, it, it will figure that out and it will run this faster version. So here is a, a, a problem that we, that we faced up. We have to be able to take it, the IT, this template type, which you don't know anything about, you have to somehow be able to extract some information about what it is, okay? We need to determine if it is random access. Secondly, once you determine if it is random access, then you can determine, okay, should I run this piece of code or this piece of code? Right. So we run the, uh, the the fast one or the slow one based on if it is a random access. Here's a problem. If it is not random access, this line of code doesn't even compile. The first, the last minus first doesn't even even compile. Okay. Which uh, which is going to be be a problem if we um, if we are trying to compile this code. So here's what we will try to aim for towards the end. We will try to do something like this. Uh, for category is equal to whatever type, whatever kind of iterator it is. And then we're going to do some form of logic that looks like this. If category is random access, then return last minus first, else you do this slow version. Okay. At the end, end of lecture today, we will, we will be writing code that looks something like this, uh, where we will be able to figure out what to, to be able to get some information about what it is, what this template type is, what kind of iterator it is, and then be able to check if the iterator is of that type. Okay, this is this idea of type dispatch where even though you have a template, um, a template function which is able to accept uh, any different type, but we can actually do the implementation of this function differently based on what exact type uh, IT is. It's combining the flexibility of templates along with the along with the um, with the ability to try to figure out what a type it exactly is and perhaps optimize based on that. Okay, so this is the code that we'll be working towards at the end. Avery, yeah. it's just a, a mm -hmm. question, right? Sure. Um, that I think there are pretty good reasons why we don't do this, but um, couldn't this problem be solved from theoretical perspective by overloading? You can imagine that if you have every all the random access iterators inherit from random access iterator and mm -hmm. you have all the other ones inherit from some other iterator, then you can just overload each of the two types and use type resolution, basically. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, yeah. So let's see, uh, yeah, that's a good point. So uh, so I don't think inheritance was was covered too much in, in, in the 106 of this quarter, but uh, but um, yeah, you do pick up a good point, which is, uh, which is okay, why don't you, you can kind of overload the, uh, overload this, the, this, um, this with, with, um, with a, with like you could have one version which is specifically if it was a if it was a uh, iterator for uh, like a random access iterator and then other an, another function which works in general. Uh, I'd say there are two reasons um, why why we don't really do that. One is um, by requiring some inheritance hierarchy to be able to implement that kind of logic uh, that makes the type system a bit inflexible um, because suppose you wanted to. Suppose we here we, we would be able to not only dispatch based on uh, what kind of iterator it is input output uh, for example we could we might also be dispatching based on uh, what if the input was a double what if the underlying container stored doubles stored ints uh, if you had different dimensions in which you wanted to 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 dispatch uh, to have different implementations based on the type that wouldn't work necessarily as well um, yeah the, a big uh, improvement of of templates versus um, inheritance is that it's, it's a bit more flexible in that if you have multiple dimensions in which you want to, to have templates in, uh, templates are more flexible in that manner. Okay. So is to just to summarize, like um, we want to be able to make decisions not just based on the fundamental type, but like many, perhaps many other characteristics. And right. TMP lets us do that. Mm -hmm. All right, can I answer any questions about this piece of code? So obviously this piece of code doesn't compile yet. Uh, so we'll actually figure out what this means. How can we implement something like that? Okay, 
Uh, let's move on. Uh, I think I'm a little behind on time, so I will uh, move a little faster. Okay, so let's talk about computations on types. So notice that here, oh, um, yeah. So we're, we're actually gonna talk about computations on types because what the fundamental problem we have here is we need to be able to take a template type and query some information about it. Okay, so we have to be operating on the type IT. So what we're going to introduce is we're going to introduce the concept of a computation on a type. Now we're going to do that is we're going to do a side by side comparison. Computations on values, where this is the programs that you've mostly written right now. And then we're also going to see an analogous uh, way of how can we do computations on different types. So the variable that you're that you're computing on are, are actual types. So in normal uh, com computations, uh, when you're doing values, you can store these values in variables. So we have a variable s which stores three. On the computation side, you can store um, you can store types in sort of these are not variables, but they're like type aliases. You can store some type in this uh, in this variable s. Okay. So on the so this is a comparison of the value versus the, the, the type side. Okay, so uh, fundamentally, if you are trying to store variables, these are um, two, uh, these are the ways to do it for a value and on a type. You can do, you can create new values using ver the values of previous values. So we can create a variable triple, which uses the, of the variable s from before. Similarly, for types, you can create a new type, which is some old type. But then you, but then you're trying to apply something uh, on it. So on the value side, we multiplied it by three. On the type side, you can actually take an existing type, uh, some type of s, and then you decorate it with a const and an and a uh, root reference. So cl reference here is the type const s a reference, const int reference. Okay. Now the most common thing you'll do for values is to pass them into functions, and then you get return values out. Okay. Now it's kind of hard to think about how you could do that for a type. So here's one big idea we we're going to introduce today. You can pass types into what we call meta functions. So a meta function looks like that. You can pass them into meta functions, and then you can get types out of these meta functions. Okay. No notice the syntax is a little weird. There's something to do with templates here. Okay. Now uh, we will go much more into detail about why that syntax is the case. On the value side, you can you can do comparisons on existing variables and get Boolean values. So you can evaluate some Boolean expression. On the type side, you can do something similar. You can pass a type into a meta function. And notice that here we get a value out of the meta function. We got a Boolean out of passing two types into a meta function. Okay. Is, is, try to try to uh, focus on the the, um, the, the, the concept of like the, the meta function here, we are still able to pass types into the meta function and we can get either types or values out of these meta functions. Okay. And then lastly, it, on the value side, once you compute these Booleans, you can change control flow based on these Boolean expressions. For example, if equal is true, then you can exit your program. You can do something similar for uh, when you're, if you're computing on a type. These uh, equals here is a is a um, is a constant Boolean expression that the that the code will it will become zero or one, and then you can change the compiler generated code based on these expressions. Okay, so what does that exactly mean? I'll go into more detail a bit later. But the the general concept I want you to get is that most things we can do on values, there is a there is an analogous thing we can do on types. You can change. You, you can change uh, control flow. You can change. You can get variables. You can pass them into functions. Uh, there, there is a uh, there is a cousin to everything you can do on types. There is something similar you can do on on uh, something. Everything you can do on values. There's something you can do on types as well. Okay. I'll stop for questions on the next slide. So. Based on this, uh, this, this, I don't expect you to fully understand what the const expr, what the, uh, these meta functions are yet, because we'll do that later. But some of the old stuff you should have seen before, the, the, the using statements up here, these are type aliases. The purple thing, this, uh, this type over here, this is a member type, right? When you, um, when you are trying to access what the type of, 
what the iterator type of a, of a collection is, you would use a syntax that looks something like this, colon, colon, iterator, to be able to access the member type of a certain class. Okay, this type over here that you see is a member type. Some of the new stuff you should not uh, have seen before. The blue ones that we are, that we see over here, these are meta functions. They act like functions, but the semantics look a little different. You should not, uh, const expert should be new. We'll talk about that at the end of lecture today. And then there are also these static member values. Uh, 106B and 106L have started to not cover what static is, and it's not super important, but the idea here is that value over here is an actual value that's part of um, some class. And then, uh, and then this value is a, is a static value, which means we don't have to create a, um, a, an object to be able to access this value. This value belongs to the class. I'll go into a little more detail about what static is on the next few slides as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to stop for questions here because um, like, this is just a preview. You, you should not uh, fully understand what these three concepts are yet. Let's talk about meta functions. So just a quick recap. Template types. Template types are uh, are you can use you can use these template types when you are trying to write a template class. You when you're writing the template class, you specify what your arbitrary template type is, and then you implement your class in terms of t. When you actually create a vector of type int, then what the compiler does is it goes into your vector and it uh, it goes into this vector and it replaces every instance of t with whatever template type you instantiate it with. So here it would be an int. Okay. So um, it's the good old template types you've used previously. It turns out that you can also um, not only use template types, you can use these template values. Um, in, the, in the template arguments, you can actually put actual values. So remember, n here is not a type. It's a size underscore t. And that is allowed. And the entire implementation looks exactly the same. You can use this value n in your implementation. So uh, an STL class that uh, that you can that actually does this is the class array, um, which you can just see over here. These are fixed size arrays. This is essentially a C++ array, but is a little smarter and knows its size. Uh, came out on C++ 11, I believe. Okay. So this is um, just a recap template types and then a little extra. You can also use template values. Uh, we cover this slide where every time you instantiate the vector, you you give it some type int or double, and it take what the compiler does is it takes the the code over here and it replaces every instance of t with whatever type you instantiate it with int. So then you get this code over here, or double you get this code over here. A meta function. Let's talk about what a meta function is. On a very abstract level, a meta function is a quote function that operates on some types and or values. So this is analogous to the parameters of a function. And it outputs some types and values, which is then analogous to the return values. There's a very abstract view of a meta function. It, it's essentially a function, and it acts on input and returns output, just like normal functions do. The key thing here is that the input and output can be types and or values. OK, but this is a very abstract definition. Let's actually figure out what a meta function is. Okay, and, and this next line might blow your mind. A meta function is a struct. Okay, the, this meta function we're we've been talking about, it's a struct. It has public member types and fields, which depend on what the template types and values are instantiated with. Okay, these template types and values, they're the input. And then what the meta function, what the, this struct does is it will create these public member types and fields, this is the output of the meta function. The, the meta function, the struct, will look at its template types and values of the input, and then it will, it will put member types and fields as part of that struct, which represents the output. Okay, So the input comes from the template types. And what the struct does is it puts the outputs of the function into these public types and fields. Okay, this is a bit abstract. I don't want to focus too much on this definition because it will make a lot more sense when you see an example. Oh, uh, here's a, a, a nice diagram comparing a regular function with a meta function. Regular function, you pass in parameters, you get return values. For a for a meta function, you pass in template types as part of the template arguments, and then it will put either a member type called type. This is the output, 
or it will put a, a, a static member called a value, which would be the value that is returned. Okay, don't wanna dwell on this too, a little too much because it's very abstract. Let's go into a concrete definition. We're gonna write up an identity function. And what it does is it takes in some input, the input could be a type, could be a, a value. And what it does is it will output the exact same type or value. Okay, so it doesn't do anything too interesting. It just it returns itself. How do we use this meta function? Well, it's kind of like, like that syntax we saw before, right? You, uh, you are gonna call, uh, not call, but use the struct. You're gonna pass in the input as the template values, as the template types or template values. And then you're gonna try to access its um, member types or its static member variables, okay? The, the member type is called type. The member variables is called values. Just by convention, they, you always use type if you are trying to return a type, you always use value if you want to return a value. Okay, so this is how um, these meta functions are going to be used. Let's actually try to implement it. So these meta functions are structs, and the input, the template type to these structs are whatever input the, the meta function should be getting. So the input to the identity meta function should be a type. That's why we're going to templatize it using some type T. And then for on the value side, we're going to the input will be an int, so we're going to templatize it based on some int. The output is we're going to take whatever the input that we're given, and we're going to do some operations on it and put it as the output. The output for uh, for the left side is we're going to put the output in an alias in a member type called type. On the on the, uh, on the right side, the, the variable side, we're going to put the, the output v as the as static value, as a static member called value. So just looking at this example, you should be able to see how we got this usage based on this implementation. Right? You pass in t over here. When you pass in t, this struct is instantiated with t is int. It replaces the t with an int over here. And that's why when you write identity uh, colon colon type, it will access whatever member type the type here is, which uh, we replaced it as an int here. So that's why this whole thing gives you an int. Similar over here, uh, when you pass it in three, the compiler instantiates this struct with v equals three. So we have an identity struct where the v here is equal to three. Then when you try to try to identify, uh, when you try to call identity the colon colon value, it will retrieve this value for you. Okay, let me pause over here because I'm sure you have a lot of questions about what this is. Uh, there is one question which I have uh, which I have prepared in advance. So let's see if, if anyone will ask that question. But other than that, are there any questions I can answer about this example? The goal of this is to show you the semantics of where do we get the inputs of a meta function? Where do we get the outputs of the meta function? Identity doesn't do anything useful. Okay, so my question is, is it necessary to like write two of these whenever we want to like access either the type name or the value, or is there some kind of compact way of combining both of these? Uh, I, uh, I see. So you're saying um, like both the left and the right hand side, can we combine them into one single one? Right. Yeah. Um, I think that might be a little challenging because I think it might be challenging simply because uh, simply because then you'll need some way to figure out uh, like how, how do we figure out if there's a type here, if there's a value here. Um, I'm sure there's there's some there's some trick you can do where you can set some of these like you can have a type name T and an int uh, U and then somehow be able to do uh, like use default arguments to if you only put the type then you then you can ignore the value. If you put the value, then you ignore the type somehow. And then down here, then, then you, would, you would access the one that you want using either type or value. So I think that's probably something you can do. Yeah, uh, in general, what they will do is uh, they will name these differently because, uh, because just to avoid confusion about what T is and what V is. Yeah, good question. I have another question. Sure. So. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit, so, so, so all of this happens in compile time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yes. what, So how, how much can it do? Can we, what, what happens if we have like a, a for loop and so like uh, a for loop 
that goes goes through the loop three times. And inside the for loop, we have like using k is equal to a reference to k, right? Can it do that? Will it have like a triple reference? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, good, good question. So right now we are, we've been writing a pretty simple function. We don't, you, you don't have to do too much to the type. It turned out that if you want to do any, if you want to just make this meta function a little bit more complicated, we will have to introduce some new techniques to be able to actually change what T is. Okay. Uh, as you mentioned, writing a for loop, remember that within this struct, you're not actually, you're not actually within any function. This is currently in a struct declaration. So you, you don't really have a function. So you can't really have like for loops. You can't have variables. Uh, you can't have, uh, have anything of that sort. Um, yeah, we don't have a function inside a, a, our struct yet. So you can't use uh, most of the techniques that you know so far. So for example, if you wanted to return, uh, like if, if you wanted to do some, to use this example, but instead of returning V, you wanted to return like the Fibonacci numbers, uh, you, you can't write a for loop here to try to calculate the Fibonacci numbers because you don't really have a function here. You really just have uh, some expression that you have to compute at compile time. So we, we will see only, a tech, uh -huh. yeah. We can only use the using keyword inside a struct. Um, if you wanted to use, you can use the using keyword. So remember that a struct is kind of like a class. So anything you can put inside the class declaration, you can do. Um, so, but then when we are trying to compute what this type is, is you you can't figure out what that type is by writing a function and then writing like a, like a normal function and then trying to set what type is because when you write a, a normal function um, that requires something to be run at, at runtime. Um, I, there is uh, there is something you can do uh, that's uh, using const expr, but uh, I will defer that to later. Yeah, but uh, I do agree that right now this technique feels very limited. There's not too much you can do uh, right now because all that. Like on the type side, all that we can do is just put T as the, the type. If you want to do anything more complicated with T, we will have to introduce a new technique. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I, I'll, I'll go into more, more depth about your question a bit later because um, there will be some developments about what, I can, what you can do with this type T. Okay, but uh, oh yeah. So the question that I thought someone was gonna ask is why do we need a static here? The reason why we need a static here is that notice that when we are using this meta function, we don't we never instantiate a a, uh, a struct. So because of that, we never um, we don't want to have to create an object of type identity. We really just want to use this this meta function itself. So by putting a static here, what we're saying is this value belongs to the entire struct and not a particular object. Okay. By doing that, now, then we don't have to call a constructor to create an identity struct and then call its value field. We can simply use this notation because the value field here belongs to the identity. Okay, are there any other questions I can answer? I know I'm a little slow on time. Um, somebody asked if we can disable the constructor for these. Yeah, um, you can con disable the constructor. Um, you can disable the constructor, although I think in general, if you know that you're going to be using these meta functions, uh, there's a sort of convention as to like the, these are these are meta functions. Don't try to uh, don't try to create an, an instance of, of these meta functions um, themselves. So I guess you, you could disable the constructors uh, by using constructor equals delete. Uh, normally, because we whoever's using this knows that it's the meta function. Um, I don't, there may or may not be a need to do that. I'm not sure if the STL does that. The STL might do that just to prevent you from doing Probably do uh, this something. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Okay, so yeah, this is a, kind of an interesting, uh, interesting way to see structs. Right. We're not using them. We're not using a struct as it was intended. It was intended to be kind of like a class, but no, we're using a struct to, to simulate what a function looks like. And this function can accept and return types or values. Okay, so uh, a summary, a meta function is a struct that treats its template types and values as the parameters and it places the return values as public members. We never create an instance of this, uh, of this struct. 
right? That's why the public members are static. Okay, I think I, I asked for questions already. So I think I'll move on to another example. Let's write a meta function called is same. And what is same is gonna do is it's going to accept two types or two values. And it's going to put, it's gonna put either true or false into the member, uh, the static member fair value. So remember here that the output for both of these are gonna be values. Okay, so same as before, we can accept um, two types or two ints. And then you, you would have a static field called value. So on the right side, it's easy to implement. You would just say v equals w. That would be what the value of, uh, what the value of this field called value is. So if you put three and three, this would be true. If you put three and four, this would be false. So this side is easy to implement. This side on the other hand is a little tougher, right? The, the, the left side, because here you need to check if T is equal to U and we don't really have a way to do that. In fact, the whole point of implementing this is to be able to check if T is equal to U. So there is no, um, there is no construct that you know yet that allows you to check if two types are equal. So we will need to get, a, we, need, we need to get around this problem. And that get, brings us to template deduction. Okay, this is a more advanced template technique that, uh, that I'm gonna introduce very briefly right now. There's a concept called template set specialization. Template specialization means you can have generic templates as well as specialized templates. Okay, this will make sense when, once we do an example. This is a very famous example of specialization. The STL implementation of vector has a generic implementation and it also has a specialized implementation. The generic implementation is uh, exactly what you know. It's an implementation using an array that is resized if you need to. The implementation of a vector of bools is, is specialized to be more space efficient. Instead of using an array, which stores uh, one Boolean each, uh, if, if you do that, I think it requires like eight bytes per, per uh, Boolean. So instead what it does is it stores all the Booleans in a bit array. So that's more space efficient. Each element takes one bit. Okay, and what C++ allows you to do is if you implement, uh, you can implement a generic template and you can specialize that template for a particular type. Notice here that, that the template type T is gone. We're gonna say this is specifically if you have a vector of Booleans, then there is the specialization that is chosen. Okay, so, so just to recap, if you instantiate a vector of Booleans, we, you get the bottom one. If you instantiate a vector of ints, you get the top one. Okay, does it make, make sense so far? Uh, Josh, to instantiate the specialized vector, you just do std colon colon vector with a Boolean, with just bool, and it automatically chooses the specialized implementation instead. This is bad because the specialized version doesn't actually conform to all the type requirements of a vector. In particular, you can't actually edit its elements by reference because there is no variable, it's just a bit. And so it's a disaster and it's horrible. And it's like a, the best idea and it's the most horribly executed thing on the planet. So. Right, um, right. So it's actually very interesting. The, uh, the Stanford libraries, um, so the Stanford libraries are like a layer above the STL. And what Julie has done, which I thought was really cool, was, uh, was she wrote some logic so that if you try to instantiate a vector, uh, like a Stanford vector of Booleans, underneath you actually get a deck of Booleans because, uh, because vector of Booleans are, uh, are like, whoever came up with this uh, was trying to be clever, but it turned out to be a, a bad idea. So uh, people tend to avoid vector of Booleans. There's also a question from Stefan was asking, what's the point of a template that does nothing on the second example? Like why not just delete that line? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, good question. So, so the template here is really just to emphasize that, uh, that these are both, uh, I guess all of these are template classes. It's just they're specialized with, uh, they're specialized to take different degrees. So this one is a generic one. Here we're just saying that, that, uh, that this one does not use any template types. It's still a template class because it's part of uh, all of these template classes, but uh, this one in particular does not use any template arguments because we're gonna replace them with the Boolean here. Okay, and I think it's point is just to emphasize that these are part of, these are all template classes. This one doesn't just override this one. Okay, now you can, you can partially specialize a, a, a template class. So instead of the, the, the top one, we have a fully generic one of a hash map. 
at the bottom one, we have a fully specialized one of a hash map. So here we specialize the key and the value to specifically be int. You cannot actually specialize halfway. Like instead of specializing both, you can specialize just one argument. So the other type of V can still be some, uh, some arbitrary type. You can also be a little bit more uh, complicated and you can, uh, you can write these extra templates. This one will only match if, your, if whatever your first type is can be matched to K star. So that type has to be a pointer. So we have varying degrees of specialization. And what the compiler will do is it will try to match to the most specialized specialization uh, out of all of these. If none of them work, then you default to the more generic one. Okay. Now, in practice, no one specializes hash maps in this way. I'm just doing an example. Uh, but you can imagine some optimization where if your key is like, if your key or your values are very nice, you can uh, store your, your hash map in a more specialized manner. Okay. Uh, on your assignment, assignment two, uh, you, you can try to specialize the hash map class. All right. Anyways, so um, I skip there. A okay, few slides where if you want to learn more about these template rules, you can read them. There are a lot of weird template rules. The general idea I want you to get is when you write all these templates, what the compiler does is it will rank all of these templates, and then it will try the templates one by one by one until it finds one that works. Okay. This ranking is go going to be from most specialized to least specialized. So it will try to do the most specific template first before it tries the less successful ones. If it fails, if it tries a template and it fails, that's totally fine. It will just try the, the next one in order until you see uh, that none of them work, in which case you get a compiler error, or if there's a tie. Now, the error, if there is no, no work, you've actually seen this. You've actually seen the error message if none of them work, right? When you write a, a template class, what the error message you'll see if you do something wrong is you'll see, oh, um, it tries to, I think you'll see something like, oh, it tries, it tries this, then it tries this, then it tries this, then it tries this. If you look at the compiler output, the error messages, you can actually see it say, it tried this one, doesn't work. It tried this one, it doesn't work. It tried this one, it doesn't work. And it turns out that vector has like, has like over 10 different uh, specializations that it has. So when you do something wrong with a vector, you actually see this gigantic host of error messages about, oh, you, you did something wrong. Um, you did something wrong and it proves to you that it did something wrong by saying it tried the first one, didn't work. It tried the second one, didn't work. It tried every single thing, none of them worked. Okay, that's why you get the error messages because it's trying every single specialization. Okay, uh, we're almost out of time. But I do want to finish, just quickly wrap this up. We're in this little code snippet. Take two or three minutes and try to figure out why this implementation works. I should look at the, the check. All right, uh, I'm gonna get, give everyone like two, uh, like one more minute, try to figure out what, try to figure out how this, this, uh, these work. And try, uh, it, it might be nice to walk through these two examples about why does the first one give you false and the second one give you true. Anyone wanna take a crack at it? Anyone? There's some people in the uh, chat. I can, I can, I can try. Yes, it's, uh, you can go. It's, it's kind of weird. It's like if you have the same type passing in, then it'll default to the is same because that has like the the T, T, which means that you have the same type. But if you have two different types, then I'll use the, uh, the one where it's type name T, type name U, I think. <laughs> Maybe. 
Yeah, 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 perfect. So um, yeah, here we are exploiting the fact, here we're exploiting the fact that the compiler will always check the most specialized one before going to the generic one. Okay, so that is very important here. Here, in the first example, when the types are different, it first tries to match this, the, the bottom one, and it will try, okay, can I put T as an int? Nope, that doesn't work. Can I try T as a double? Nope, that doesn't work. So then this one fails, and it defaults to this one. So that's why when you run the first one, you get false, because the value here, field here is false. When Wait, T, really when- uh, Really quick yeah. clarification. For the first one, should it be is same bracket T comma U? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, good, good question. So uh, actually for a long time, uh, I was confused about this as well. Uh, it turns out that if you are not special, if you're writing a generic template, you don't put the, the, the type here. So you distinguish whether or not this is specialized based on whether or not there's an angle bracket here. Okay, all right, for the bottom example, if T, so if both are ints, then the compiler tries to match the bottom one first. It tries T equals int and it works. So then what it does is uh, when you, when you create, uh, when you instantiate this class, you get the bottom one, which is why if you try to access its value field, you get true. Okay, before I get to questions, just wanna say, just wanna say, uh, oh, so if for reference, later you can read the slide to get a reference, but, um, but we can actually use the same technique to implement a host of other different things. Anytime you need an if else statement, you can use this technique, which will give you an if, if else statement. So for example, you can match, um, you can implement is pointer. Okay, pretty much the, the same implementation. It will try to match the bottom one. This one only succeeds if you can actually choose T to be uh, a type that matches the, the pointer. So then, it, then the bottom one will be true. Otherwise, it defaults to the old one. It would be false. Uh, similarly, we can do, uh, instead of returning a value, you can actually return a type here. So there's a meta function called ret remove const. And what it does is it will try to match a const. If it successfully matches the const, then it puts the T as its type. So notice that the const here is gone. If it fails, if it can't match the const, then it just puts T as well. So if you try to remove const of something that does not have a const, then it just returns that value, okay? So you kind of see that this technique is basically used to implement a gigantic if else statement. If you need an if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else statement, you can basically do the same thing. Just do a lot of different specializations. Uh, make, sure you or you make sure you write them so that their orders make sense. And then this is basically a gigantic if, else statement. This, this generic one is the gigantic else if none of the specialized ones work. In this just, example, just to summarize. Uh -huh. Yeah, sorry. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, in this example, why do we need to have two different ones if the inside is the same in both cases? Yeah, uh, good question. So do we need different ones here because the, the bottom one will do a, a, a slightly different matching. When you try to match the bottom one, so for example, const t, and we try to match that to the const int here, the t here is not const int, it's int. Okay, so when, when we're looking at this part and we're trying to match it to, to the thing in the angle brackets, the, the t that we get here is actually the int. Which is why when you put it later here, the, the int, we get the type of the int. Well, up here, even though the bodies are the same, but what it's trying to match is a little different. So on the top here, if you try to match, um, this says t is the entire thing, not just the thing after the cons. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Okay, I think I'm running out of time. So just want to quickly uh, finish uh, finish this. If you need to go, pretty much the we've covered the most important thing I wanted to introduce you to, which is uh, this is how... This is how you can implement if else statements at compile time. It's very hacky, but it works and it turns out to be extremely useful. All right, I'll go a little bit over time just so we can see, wrap everything up. But uh, yeah, this is a hack. We're exploiting the compiler's template matching rules to implement an if else statement. Okay, we are implementing an if else statement by, by exploiting the template, template matching rules. Okay. Uh, let me just quickly wrap this up. So how can we implement, implement the, this distance function? Let me, uh, let me just quickly implement the, the distance function. Okay, so let's implement this distance function. And let's, what I'm gonna do is let's first, implement, let's first try to implement these two lines of code. Category equals whatever kind iterator is. How can we implement that? So it turns out we haven't written uh, this, this, um, this, this uh, meta function, but uh, it turns out the STL has a lot of very useful meta functions. 
Um, there's a meta function called iterator traits. So using category is equal to std iterator traits. This is a meta function. What it does is you can put in an iterator type. And this is very cool. This meta function has many, many return values. Okay, so it doesn't just have one return value, it has many different return values. And you can access each return value using the, um, they all have different names. So the name of the one that we want is iterator, uh, iterator category. Compilation failed. Uh, is it, oh yeah, is independent scope. So um, this is the, the, the type name error that, that, that uh, Ethan or Nikhil introduced before. Uh, because we're putting in a iterator type into uh, here, we have a dependent something template. So we just put a type name there. This is the only useful uh, compiler error message in C++. So this is a meta function. It has a lot of return values, and we're going to pick specifically the one that is called iterator category. Iter so what happens here is that category is a type that represents one of the, uh, it's actually a constant type. You can treat it as a constant, where it tells you what category this iterator is. And then what we can do here is we can actually just use our implementation of is same, is same. OK, uh, yeah, we can use our own implementation. We can use the STLs one as well, uh, where you would pass in category, and you would check if it's equal to um, random access iterator, which um, there's a type, there's a constant, which is called random access iterator tag. Uh, this is basically what category would be if this was a random access iterator. And don't forget to get the return value, which is uh, colon colon value. Um, Avery, some students are mm -hmm. wondering if you could repeat why you need type name. Sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. So I, I'm not really sure how how uh, how type name was introduced, but uh, like there is a like the reason why is because it's some, there's something called a dependent uh, dependent yeah. template type where if you're trying to put a template argument in here and you're trying to access the member type, you have to put a type name so that C++ doesn't get confused by I think the angle brackets or something. Um, honestly, like the way I taught it was was uh, this is the only useful error message in C++. Yeah. If you get an error message, it will literally tell you how to fix it and just fix yeah. it. Yeah, so the way we taught it here is just yeah. that you have to do it because there's some, it's just to disambiguate some weird compiler um, interpretation um, and you just do it. And the cool. reason why is because it's a dependent type, aka after double colon, it's a control dependent type of something that takes a template argument. And that particular sequence of operations leads to some compiled um, ambiguity unless you fix it. I'll be honest, uh, I like barely understood why we need a type name here, but I knew yes. that, uh, the, 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 that the compiler tells you exactly why. So, <laughs> so just write type name if you get that error. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, so this is the, the, uh, the essentially the implementation, but notice it does, still doesn't compile. Okay, if we put vector, it does compile. If we put vector, this compiles. This would work. Yeah, this compiles. Okay, and what I want, uh, actually, I'll show you the very cool thing next, but uh, if I put a set here, this doesn't compile. And the reason for that is because, okay, at compile time, the compiler figures out that this expression is false. So you will never run the first one, you will always run the second one, which is what we want. The problem is that this code is still in the code, right? This line is still in the code, and this line does not compile if you have, if you are uh, passing in set iterators because set iterators you can't do the subtraction that's why we have this compiler error okay so the issue is we not only need to be able to figure out which branch to run we need a way to completely remove the other branch from the source code okay we can't even have this line in the source code if even if that line is never going to be run if it is in the source code the code doesn't compile okay so the last thing we're going to introduce is how do we change the, the source code at compile time. Uh, oh, actually, I, I have a slide on this. Uh, yeah, so other branch doesn't compile, even though we know that branch won't ever be run. We need a way to remove the offending code if we can figure out which part won't be run. We know that the if statement will never be run, so we have to remove it completely from the, from the code. Okay, before C++ 17, so notice we're in 2017 now, uh, you would have to use this enable if, I, this is like one of my favorite functions uh, of all time. It is the most hacky function you can find in C++. Uh, it will purposely generate uh, substitution failures to like trick the compiler. Um, if you're curious, ask me after class. This is really fun. 
but um, but that, it was also kind of complicated. So C plus plus seventeen, they introduced this thing called con if const expert. What if const expert does is it calculates the the whatever the boolean expression is at compile time, and then it depending on if it's true or false, it will replace the entirety of the if else branch with the code that you will actually run. Okay, this is really cool. It's changing the source code. So let's let's actually just add that in const expert if const expert and notice the error goes away. Ooh. Okay, so now this is not cool enough because uh because I want to show you what the actual source code is generated. So let's actually go to settings, uh turn this into light mode. I have no idea why dark and light give you different things, but in light mode you can actually see something really cool. Okay, so it's totally fine if you don't understand assembly. Uh, like, honestly, I barely understand it now, but uh, if we go to, let's see, I think uh, one of these is the one that we want. Is it this one? Yeah, this one. Okay, so this is the, the, the my distance function. Okay, and this uh, is really nice in that it will highlight what each line of code, how that translates to assembly. Okay, there should be one thing that is very, very clear here. And that is, notice that lines 15 and 16, they are not highlighted. So in the assembly, these two lines are not even part of the assembly code. This is why once you add that const expert, you do not get a compiler error. Because when the compiler evaluates this expression to be false, it completely removes this. So that's why in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in the assembly code, you only have these lines. Okay, and then just to demonstrate, if you do a vector, then you get the other branch. Okay, yeah, you get the other branch. Uh, you can, and you can actually see it for yourself. Uh, if you go to, where is that fun? Yeah, super short function, because it's one line. Uh, you can see it's calling the, this call is, is the minus operator. So notice that this part of code is completely removed from, from the source code. Uh, if you're in 107, just, just wanted to uh, show you something cool, which is uh, if you look at this, you, you can clearly see that that this is a while loop because there's a lot of jumps. There's a, if you're doing binary bomb right now, uh, there's a test, there's a jump, uh, J equals, there's a jump here that, that shows you that this code is exactly the while loop. Okay, cool. So that's basically it, uh, all I wanted to cover. We went a little over time, but that's fine. Uh, yeah, the final code that we implemented is this, where if const expert, lets you figure out um, this compile time expression and it will literally change the if statement or to whichever branch that is actually run. Therefore, you can have, you can put non-compiling code in the if else statement, as long as the if statement will help you figure out whether or not that line of code compiles. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Avery. That was a really interesting talk. Oh, uh, oh, uh, I, I, oh, I, I, I do have two, oh, two more another. slides. I do have two more slides. Oh. Okay, let me, let me finish my two more slides. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the key thing is at the end, at the end, the, the code that is generated is these two. And then, uh, and then template metaprogramming is you're modifying the actual source code of the program, const expert if you can turn on and off different pieces of, per, of the code, blah, blah, blah. Key takeaways meta templates let you treat types of variables. Uh, meta functions lets you modify these types or, or query information. Const expert if gives you flexibility to modify the source code. Uh, this allows you to optimize the code based on the type. You can imagine this kind of code appears everywhere in the STL algorithms library, where depending on what the what the type of the iterator is, it will optimize based on that type. Cool. Uh, that's it. Uh, oh, where does CMP pop up? The uh, you learned about STD move a couple uh, like two weeks ago. I don't think Ethan and Nikhil ever dug into what the parameters and return values of STD move are, but yep. you can see that S yeah, you can see that the, the return value of STD move is a meta is uh, you need to get that value, that, that type based on a meta function. Okay. And it, it's a very interesting exercise to figure out why. This is like a this this is like like a weird edge case you have to think about. Okay, so ST the STL STD move uh, has a meta function inside called remove wrestles. Secondly, if you do any machine learning, PyTorch has a uh, index select function. I use this function a lot in CS224N. Uh, notice that you see the enable if here, the is same here. Um, it's, it's essentially a way for them to optimize if your tensor is a float versus if it's some other type. 
So cool optimizations. Okay, uh, that's it. Uh, where to go next? Uh, there's a cool talk that was heavily inspired by my talk. Uh, check it out there. Uh, C20 introduced this thing called concepts. And the goal of concepts is to make everything less weird. Just make the entire code, uh, this entire con, everything we learned today less hacky and more natural. So if you want to study more about this, look at concepts. Concepts are very, very cool. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks for uh, letting me go over time. Uh, this is pretty typical of, uh, of what, when I taught the class. Uh, I would, I would, uh, I think towards the end, we kind of just gave up on 50 minute lectures and we did like 70 minute lectures. Anyways, uh, cool. Can I answer any questions? Uh, before we answer questions, I just want to say thank you all for coming today. Um, it was a really interesting talk. So thank you. Let's thank all you. unmute and applaud Avery. That's possible. Unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, yeah. And um, I think Avery will be around to um, answer your questions. One thing that I just learned from the chat is um, what does the hash if do in your assignment and why does it knock out code if, um, if, you, if it's set to zero? Um, I believe that is a, a preprocessor directive. And so it works at an even more basic level, which is the level of like mashing the text into uh, the computer before you can start compiling. So you can avoid it. That's a different way of avoiding it. Uh, but that the, using preprocessor directives is not very flexible because it's only going to do very simple things. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, uh, this summer, I, I was trying to uh, improve the, 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 um, the, the test harness to use, actually use like template metaprogramming. But, um, but then uh, I did not get it finished in time to be released to you all. So you'll have to deal with the old version. But uh, next quarter's class, we'll get the, the, the fancy template of the programming version. Amazing. And this is why we rely on every <laughs> our assignments, because we don't know how to do TMP. Um, yeah. All right, can I answer any questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, can, you oh, talk no. about question. can you talk about enable if? Um, I spent some time reading about it. I still don't understand how it works. Um, so it'd okay. be really nice to know. Ah, so enable if the, yeah, the implementation looks like this. And uh, so take a look at it for a couple of seconds. Actually, I'll, I'll let you take a look at it for a couple of seconds, and then I'll answer any other questions uh, there, uh, quest questions. And then try to think about why, uh, how this is useful. Interesting part here is that notice that, that that the generic version of enable if does not have a type. Right. So it's kind of kind of like before. The bottom one, uh, the bottom one is the is the specific type where if b, if b is a boolean, so if b is true, then it will match the bottom one, and you you will have a member called type. Okay, so if if uh, if B is true here, then this whole thing will give you int. What if B is false? Um, then you get garbage because that the type isn't even defined, and you get a scene error. Um, right. You'll but... get yeah, you'll get yeah, you'll get a compiler error, and then error. yeah. So enable if is used in this context, where so notice that the is same as a boolean. The is same here as a boolean. Right. Okay. But yeah. what then, if, mm -hmm. what if, 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 if um, it seems returning false here, um, then won't this entire, won't, won't this entire function fail to compile because yeah. there's no type defined there. Yeah, exactly. So if, if this, if the is same as false here, then enable if does not have a, a member called type. So this line will fail to compile. Okay. And, and here's where it gets really hacky. We are purposely making it so that this line does not compile because uh, I, I, I skipped a slide because it was too complicated, but uh, there is a template rule called Sfine. Substitution failure is not an error where oh. If, oh, if you try no. to substitute, if you try to substitute a type and it fails, right. what the compiler does is it just, it just ignores keeps going it. on. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I'm surprised so, that error of that nature, like there is, there was literally no type put in there at all. And yes, yet it just regards a Sphene error and not like an overall, like a terminating compiler error. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it's, it's, you have to use it in a specific manner where you have to put it, you have to put the enable if in the, uh, in the header. After, so yeah, in the after header, the yeah. to template because mm -hmm. then it's considered a template substitution error. Yeah. 
So the, the cool thing here is that this line, if it's true, it doesn't do anything. Like it, it just gives you void. Okay, this thing, like you could have just put void here and everything would be fine, but we're purposely putting this extra uh, stuff here so that if this inner Boolean is false, then this will generate a compiler error. And we are purposely making a compiler error here so that the compiler will decide to ignore this. That's why it's called enable if. If it's true, it, if it is true, then, then this function exists. If it is false, then this function does not exist. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I'll be honest, I, I came across enable if before I understood what template metaprogramming is, and I just had a hard time trying to figure out what, what exactly this line was doing. Okay, but yeah, now, now you know that, uh, that the reason why you get a compiler error here is because it doesn't even have a type called type. It is at these times that you wish you were writing a um, dynamically typed language. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you in tell fact, yourself you it's worth it for the speed up. So. Yeah, you will see some uh, some some programming languages which try to. Uh, I don't know too much about other programming languages. Maybe Rust, maybe Go. Uh, Rust does not uh, do Rust does this not? sort of stuff. I, okay, Rust does okay. not have a. Rust is less taught on the whole um, like weird template situation. They generally try to stay as, um, stay away from that, as far as I know. But again, okay. I'm ex I'm extremely unfamiliar with Rust. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you can only get get this madness uh, in C plus plus. Oh, to quote, how can I, uh, this is amazing. How can I replicate my Sphene based C++ code in Rust? Um, <laughs> there's something called specialization, uh, which lets you, it's a more art elegant way of doing it. It is nothing like uh, Sphene. Um, and it's also only available in nightly Rust. So uh, not really reliable. You can do um, inter interfaces, which are basically like concepts-ish, right? And that sort of solves all your problems in a much, 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 more nice, much nicer way. Sorry, trait, fun fact. Not trait, not interfaces. Fun fact, uh, <laughs> Google recommends that you avoid template programming. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah. basically, uh, if I remember correctly in Rust, a trait lets you place a, um, like a labels on classes without having to go through the, the inheritance system. And so it lets you only write functions for the class that match specific traits, which lets you sort of get around the entire inspecting classes at compile time issue because you can just define as trait that fits your needs. Yeah, yeah. In fact, these uh, these template uh, these these template uh, meta these meta functions that you see over here they actually part of a, a library called type traits. Amazing. Yeah. So. And if you think this um, is, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So you know how to implement these meta functions by yourself now, but there is a whole library of them. There's a gigantic library of every single meta, uh, meta function you might need. So for example, if you wanted to check if the type is a floating point number, you have one over here. And then you can actually see how it's implemented. <laughs> no, you can actually see how it's implemented. Uh, yeah, the, the cool thing is you essentially start with these like very low level constructs like is same. And then you can generally slowly build up towards more complicated ones like is floating point. And then somehow you're able to get like uh, these in, oh, you can check if it has a copy constructor, which I thought was very cool. Uh, you can check if it has a virtual destructor. You can check if it has, uh, yeah, all sorts of things. There is yeah. a question so, from, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we mean by hashing string literals for compile time macro? Yeah, yeah, um, let's see what the, yeah. It's been a while since I wrote that. So let me change think about that. Compile hashing string literals for the compile time macro. So you would create a you would create something which acts like a macro, and then what? Yeah. So so what happens is um is you would create create a macro, and then and then every time you want to hash that macro, every time you want to hash a string, you wrap the mac the string, you, you wrap the macro around the string. So so let me just type it out. So you would do something like uh. You would you would create create some macro. It can it can be an actual macro. It can be a template metaprogramming macro called hash string. And then every time in your code you want to uh, hash a string, you you just wrap that around. Uh, hello. And then what this needs to do is at compile time it has to replace every instance of this with the actual hash code for seventy three seventy four. Um, yeah, the key idea, I, I remember doing this one, it's very hard to get it to compile. 
getting it to work is not hard. Getting it to compile is very hard. Yeah, I've just posted a link to um, an older version that doesn't use um, a TMP. But basically, they wrote a bunch of macros that all interface with each other to implement some string hashing algorithm. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that the, that the second one will be more accessible once you've taken one of seven, because there's a lot of uh, like compiler, like it would help if you understood how if you understood more deeply about how the compiler works. Yeah, especially if you look at that link that Ethan said, there's a lot of bit shifting on it. So uh, I think it would make a lot of sense to to uh, to work on this once you have taken one of seven. Yeah. If this sort of nonsense appeals to you, consider taking a compilers class. Um, there's some really nice, I mean, Avery probably knows more about what to take in this area, but like a high level compilers class has some really funky, interesting things we talked about. Yeah, yeah, I, I have not taken compilers yet, but I, but I, I oh, do really? want to take that sometime. Yeah, I have not taken it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I decided to, uh, to, uh, to, for some reason, get involved with, uh, with, with 229 that quarter. I skipped down on compilers, Amazing. so I <laughs> so I did not do compilers, but I, I probably will take compilers soon. Uh, yeah, but anyway, I said, these are cool classes, um, operating systems, compilers. You will understand a lot about how the compiler works, and then uh, that will inform you a lot about C++. To really understand C++, uh, understand what the performance it brings, it helps a ton to look at the, the, the assembly. Um, one of my favorite C++ YouTubers, see, there are C++ YouTubers. You, you can't believe it. There are C++ YouTubers. Uh, Jason Turner, uh, his, uh, his videos always use this, this, uh, this compiler explorer. And then he would show you what the code looks like, what the assembly looks like, show you that, oh yeah, there is actually a performance gain. We saved two assembly instructions by writing this instead of this. <laughs> stuff like that, stuff like that. Yeah, it's helpful to try to imagine what an optimization looks like by looking at the assembly. Okay, cool. Yeah, Any other questions? You C++ TikToks. Oh, really? Oh, wow. I've actually never seen that. Let me, let me no, 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 no. I was saying, like, somebody mentioned in the chat, or Ethan mentioned C++ TikToks. That was, that I don't be... think they actually exist. I hope they, they don't, don't exist. exist. They don't exist. That would They're be not... great. Yeah. Make, it the, um, make it the, uh, the alternative um, assignment. You have a for, good point. For... Um, let me stop recording. Yeah. If, 